Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God. Back with you with the next video in my series, Reading Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Without further ado, returning to Frankenstein as read by Lord Naren White. But here were books, and here were men who had penetrated deeper and knew more. I took their word for all that they averred, and I became their disciple. It may appear strange that should arise in the 18th century, but while I followed at the routine of education in the schools of Geneva, I was, to a great degree, self-taught with regard to my favorite studies. My father was not scientific and I was left to struggle with a child's blindness. Added to a student's thirst for knowledge, under the guidance of my new preceptors, I entered with the greatest diligence into the search of the Philosopher's Stone and the Elixir of Life, but the latter soon obtained my undivided attention. Wealth was an inferior object, but what glory would attend the discovery if I could banish disease from the human frame? and render man invulnerable to any but a violent death. Nor were these my only visions. The raising of ghosts or devils was a promise liberally accorded by my favorite authors, the fulfillment of which I most eagerly sought. And if my incantations were always unsuccessful, I attributed the failure rather to my own inexperience and a mistake than a want of skill or fidelity in my instructors. And thus, for a time, I was occupied by exploded systems, mingling like an unadept, thousand contradictory theories and floundering, desperately in a very slow of multifarious knowledge, guided by an ancient, excuse me, by an ardent imagination and childish reasoning, till an accident change again changed the current of my ideas. When I was about fifteen years old, we had retired to our house near Bell Reeve, where we, when we witnessed a most violent and terrible thunderstorm. It advanced from behind the mountains of Jura, and the thunder burst at once with frightful loudness from various quarters of the heavens. I remained again while the storm lasted, watching its progress with curiosity and delight. As I stood at the door, on a sudden, I beheld a stream of fire issue from an old and beautiful oak, which stood about twenty yards from our house. And so soon as this dazzling light vanished, the oak had disappeared, and nothing remained but a blasted stump. When we visited it the next morning, we found the tree shattered in a singular manner. It was not splintered by the shock, but entirely reduced to thin ribbons of wood. I never beheld anything so utterly destroyed. Before this, I was not unacquainted with the more obvious laws of electricity. On this occasion, a man of great research in natural philosophy was with us, and excited by this catastrophe. He entered on the explanation of a theory, which he had formed on the subject of electricity and galvanism, which was at once new and astonishing to me. All that he said threw greatly into the shade Cornelius Greppa, Albertus Magnus, and Paracelsus, the lords of my imagination. But by some fatality, the overthrow of these men disinclined me to pursue my accustomed studies. It seemed to me as if nothing would or could ever be known. All that had so long engaged my attention suddenly grew despicable. By one of those caprices of the mind, which we are perhaps most subject to in early youth, I at once gave up my former occupations, set down natural history, and all its progeny as a deformed and abortive creation, and entertained the greatest disdain for a would-be science, which could never even step within the threshold of real knowledge. In this mood of Mind, I betook myself to the mathematics and the branches of study, appertaining to that science as being built upon secure foundations, and so worthy of my consideration. Thus, strangely, are our souls constructed, 
and by such slight ligaments are we bound to prosperity or ruin. When I look back, it seems to me as if this almost miraculous change of inclination and will was the immediate suggestion of the guardian angel of my life. The last effort was made by the spirit of preservation to avert the storm that was even then hanging in the stars and ready to envelop me. Her victory was announced by an unusual tranquility and gladness of soul, which followed the relinquishing of my ancient and latterly tormenting idea studies. It was thus that I was to be taught to associate evil with their prosecution, happiness with their disregard. It was a strong effort of the spirit of good, but it was ineffectual. Destiny was too potent, and her immutable laws had decreed my utter and terrible destruction. Chapter 3 When I had attained the age of seventeen, my parents resolved that I should become a student at the University of Ingolstadt. I had hitherto attended the schools of Geneva, but my father thought it necessary for the completion of my education that I should be made acquainted with other customs than those of my native country. My departure was therefore fixed at an early date, but before the day resolved upon could arrive, the first misfortune of my life occurred, an omen, as it were, of my future misery. Elizabeth had caught the scarlet fever, her illness was severe, and she was in the greatest danger. During her illness, many arguments had been urged to persuade my mother to refrain from attending upon her. She had at first yielded to our entreaties, but when she heard the life of her favorite was menaced, she could no longer control her anxiety. She attended her sickbed. Her watchful attentions triumphed over the malignity of the distemper. Elizabeth was saved. But the consequences of this imprudent were fatal to her preserver. On the third day, my mother sickened. Her fever was accompanied by the most alarming symptoms. And the looks of her medical attendants prognosticated the worst event. On her deathbed, the fortitude and benignity of this best of women did not desert her. She joined the hands of Elizabeth and myself. My children, she said, my firmest hopes of future happiness were placed on the prospect of your union. This expectation will now be the consolation of your father, Elizabeth, my love. You must supply my place to the younger children. Alas, I regret that I, have, I am taken from you. And happy and beloved as I have been, it is not hard to, to quit you all. But these are not thoughts befitting me. I will endeavor to resign myself cheerfully to death and will indulge a hope of meeting you in another world. She died calmly, and her countenance expressed affection even in death. I need not describe the feelings of those whose dearest ties are rent by that most irreparable evil, the void that presents itself to the soul, and the despair that is exhibited on the countenance. It is so long before the mind can persuade itself that she whom we saw every day, whose very existence appeared a part of our own, can have departed forever that the brightness of a beloved eye can have extinguished her, and this and sound uh, a voice so familiar and dear to the ear can be hushed, never more to be heard. There are the reflections of the first days, but when the lapse of time proves the reality of the evil, then the actual bitterness of grief commences. And we'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching. And I hope you enjoy. Please like, comment, and subscribe as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care and thanks again.